Witches of New York, a novel by Amy McKay, performed by Julia Whalen. A rebel, how glorious the name sounds when applied to a woman. O oh, rebellious woman, to you the world looks in hope. Upon you has fallen the glorious task of bringing liberty to the earth and all the inhabitants thereof. Matilda Joslyn Gage Resist much, obey little. Walt Whitman September 4th, 1880 New Moon City of Wonders In the dusky haze of evening, a ruddy-cheeked newsboy strode along Fifth Avenue proclaiming the future. The great Egyptian obelisk is about to land on our shores. The Brooklyn Bridge set to become the eighth wonder of the world. Broadway soon to glow with electric light. In his wake, a crippled man shuffled, spouting prophecies of his own. God's judgment is upon us. The end of the world is nigh. New York had become a city of astonishments. Wonders and marvels came so frequent and fast, a day without spectacle was cause for concern. Men involved themselves with the business of making miracles. Men in starched collars and suits, men in wool caps and dirty boots. From courtrooms to boardrooms, to the newsrooms of Park Row, from dockyards to scaffolds to Mr. Roebling's great bridge, every man to a one had a head full of schemes. To erect a monument to genius, to become a wizard of invention, to discover the unknown. They set their sights on greatness, while setting their watches to the noontime drop of the Western Union time ball. Their dreams no longer came to them via stardust and angel's wings, but by tug, train, and telegraph. Sleep lost all meaning now that time was in man's grasp. In the building beneath the tower that held the time ball, a mindful order of women sat, 100 young ladies in all. Side by side, row on row, story upon story, fingers poised on telegraph keys as they worked around the clock to translate the wishes of men into dots and dashes. Transfixed by the steady click-clack of their task, the ghost of Mr. Samuel Morse hovered near. he tried to get to heaven on numerous occasions, but could never seem to find his way past the tangled canopy of telegraph lines that crisscrossed the skies above Manhattan. What he needed was an angel, or better yet, a witch. Someone to translate the knocks and rappings of his soul, to convey all the things he'd left unsaid. Where could one be found? Were there any left? In a halo of lamplight around the corner from the Western Union building, a prostitute leaned her aching back against the bricks. Lips rouged, eyes rimmed with charcoal, she was waiting for a man. Puffing on a cigarette she'd begged off another whore, she blew a steady stream of smoke rings in the air. At the edge of her sight, a shadowy figure in the shape of a finely dressed gentleman appeared, five feet off the ground, coattails flapping in the breeze, seemingly there, yet distinctly not. Rubbing her eyes, the girl shook her head, thinking she'd had too much to drink. She swore, hand to God, she'd get off the booze one day. Not now, of course. Maybe in the spring. As the ghost dissolved from her view, the girl flicked the stub of her cigarette to the ground and crushed it with the heel of her boot. Hand in her pocket, she reached for a trinket she'd been given by her last John. A lucky rabbit's foot, he'd said, blessed by a bona fide witch. Liar, the girl had complained when he'd offered her the charm, along with half of what he was supposed to pay. No, 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 the John had insisted. I tell you, she was real. A real witch with a crystal ball, a black cat, and a very fine ass. 
With that, the girl had snatched the trinket and sent the John on his way. Something was better than nothing. She needed all the help she could get. Stroking the soft fur of the rabbit's foot, the girl thought of all she lacked. She was tired, she needed sleep, she wanted more booze. When she glanced at the spot where she'd snuffed out the butt, there was a shiny new dime in its place. Picking the coin off the ground, she wondered if maybe the John had been right after all. Maybe the damn foot was lucky. Maybe the witch was real. Maybe because the John had dipped his willy in a witch and then dipped it in her, he'd left behind some strange magic. There were worse things she could catch, she guessed. In the shadow of the great bridge, a young widow knelt to plead with the river. Just after supper, she'd spied something terrible in the soapy murk of her dishwater, a vision she'd seen once before, one she'd hoped she'd soon forget. Each time she closed her eyes, it came to her again, a man's face, bloated and blue, gasping for air. The last time she'd seen it, it had been her husband's. This time, it was a stranger's. I understand, the woman said to the river, touching the surface of the water with a finger. I know how it feels to be slighted. She also understood that the river required payment from those who wished to cross it. Blood, flesh, and bone were what it liked best. The widow didn't have much of anything to give as an offering. A few pennies, a splash of whiskey, the cheerful tune of an ancient song. But she hoped that if she was gentle, persuasive, and kind, the river might change its mind. Was it witchcraft she was plying? She didn't care so long as it worked. Something had to be done. Something was better than nothing. In the cellar of a modest house on the edge of the tenderloin, a weary housekeeper lit a candle and said a prayer. Taper in one hand, glass jar in the other, she poured wax around the edge of the jar's lid to seal it shut. The jar, filled with stale urine, old needles, shards of mirror, brass buttons, bent nails, and 13 drops of blood from her left thumb, was what her grandmother had called a witch's bottle, a crude charm meant to guard against hexes. While others might call it humbug, the housekeeper saw it as her last hope to dispel the strange darkness that had settled in her midst. What else could explain all that had happened since the master of the house had passed? For weeks, she'd been plagued by what she thought was a ghost, or perhaps a demon, lurking in her room, stealing her sight, shaking her bed night after night. What did it want? Where had it come from? Why wouldn't it leave her alone? Prayers, hymns, and a desperate stint of almsgiving hadn't driven it away. She feared the terrible thing wouldn't rest until it saw her dead. Had she been cursed? Something had to be done. As her grandmother would say, wo gibt es Hexen, gibt es Geisse. Where there are witches, there are ghosts. In a quiet corner of a cozy tea shop, just shy of Madison Square Park, a magnificent raven sat on a perch, preening his feathers. As the bird tugged and fussed at his wing, three women conversed around a nearby table. One, a lady of considerable wealth, the others a pair of witches, keepers of the bird and the shop. Can you help? The lady inquired, worry catching in her throat. I'm at my wit's end. Something must be done. One witch answered with a confident, of course. The other humbly replied, leave it with us. The raven cast an indifferent eye upon them. He'd witnessed this sort of thing before. The woman, unable to manage her affairs, needed a witch or two to make things right. That was all fine and good, but he was far more interested in a faint sound coming from overhead, an enchanting jangle akin to when prisms on a chandelier collide. But how could that be when there was no chandelier to be found in the shop? He was certain unexpected magic was afoot. Tea was poured, complaints and concerns heard, sympathy given. Cards and grimoire consulted, palms and tea leaves read. How pleased the bird was when he noticed the tray of tea cakes in the center of the table had barely been touched. How pleased the lady was when the witches presented her with a small package tied with red string. 
The lady was sure she felt something move within the parcel, a tiny tremor of mystical vibration, perhaps, a sign of things to come. She'd heard rumors from a friend of a friend that these women could work miracles. She prayed it was true. She wanted to believe. Lowering her voice, she said, You swear this thing has been touched by witchcraft? One of the women gave a polite nod and said, Of course, my dear, of course. The other replied with a smile and a shrug. Call it what you like. The raven simply cocked his head. It was all he could do not to laugh. Call and response. A short walk from the witch's tea shop, a preacher stood before his congregation in the sanctuary of an old cobblestone church. Every pew was filled with the faithful and the curious, quite a feat for the evening service. Among those in attendance were the church's organist, the most faithful member of the preacher's flock, and a demon dressed in gentleman's clothes, the most curious of the lot. As the congregants sat on the edges of their seats, attentive, eager, hungry for a show, the preacher began to deliver his sermon titled, Against Intuition. The speech had been born from a round of Bible dipping he'd engaged in earlier that day, a bit of sacred bibliomancy that called for him to close his eyes, let the good book fall open, and place his finger upon a verse. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. From there, the words had flown from his pen as if guided by the providence of angels. The crowd didn't much care how the reverend had come by his words, so long as he lived up to his reputation for stirring the room into a zealous frenzy. Most of the congregants present considered him to be a mouthpiece of God, a messenger of truth. The demon wondered if the charismatic pastor wasn't touched by madness. A faint buzzing that sounded in his ears each time the preacher opened his mouth suggested as much. Fixing the congregation with his gaze, the reverend gripped the edges of the pulpit and spoke with a booming yet measured voice. Certain kinds of women, proud, godless women, are prone to declare they have a knowing, a feeling, an inkling that something is right or wrong. They fancy themselves gifted. They pronounce themselves intuitive and claim they can see the answers to life's great dilemmas in their dreams or in the bottom of a teacup. Shaking his head, he pounded his fist on the pulpit and asked, Who are they to claim the gift of prophecy? What force compels them to speak such lies? The organist stared at the mirror above the harmonium at which she sat and nodded in agreement. She took in every service this way, observing the proceedings in the pitted, crooked square of silvered glass. Foolish sisters, she thought, so misguided and lost. As she shook her head in dismay, the brass charm she wore around her neck, a miniature replica of the bell that graced the church's tower, chimed sympathetically against her chest. As the preacher raised his arms in the air, the sleeves of his robes spread wide. To the organist, he looked like an angel, wings outstretched in warning, judgment, triumph. If not for the beads of sweat trailing down the back of his neck, she might have forgotten he was only human, just a man. Wiping his brow with a handkerchief, the reverend continued to speak, spitting the words as his fury mounted. These women, these false prophets, use deception as a ploy to trick others into doing their bidding. And when caught, they say it was nothing but a silly, foolish game. With a coy smile or an innocent pout, they insist no one got hurt. But be warned, this sort of deceit is no laughing matter. It is a wicked tool used by crafty women who kneel at the altar of Satan himself. A chorus of boos and hisses sounded throughout the congregation at the mention of Old Scratch. As the floor rumbled with the sound of stomping feet, the demon pulled a large gold watch from his pocket. 
Engraved with a magic sigil, a crude, ancient representation of his name, it was one of his most treasured possessions. Worrying his thumb over the symbols, the timepiece grew hot in his hand, indicating that the time had come for him to act. Witches, he said in a low grumble, matter-of-factly planting the seed. Two men in black suits on either side of him, attendants of sorts, did the same. Then the congregants began to titter, repeating the word here and there. Witches, 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 they whispered. As their excitement grew, the seed bore fruit. Lock them up, let them burn, suffer the witch. The corners of the demon's lips curved up in satisfaction. He detested everything about witches, most especially their uncanny ability to get in his way. Through the ages, he'd succeeded in holding them back, in keeping them in check. For a time, he'd thought he'd destroyed them completely, but he had it on good authority that the witches would soon rise again. He hated when prophecy wasn't on his side. Past experience had taught him to keep his own hands clean of witches whenever he could. Why bother with getting messy himself when there were men to unknowingly do his dirty work? Religious folk could be so deliciously predictable. He could set his watch by their hypocrisy. And he did. From her perch above the congregation, the organist joined the rising voices. Witches, she whispered, hands clasped in prayer. God guide me to assist thee. The reverend looked on the congregants and smiled, buoyed by their fervor and the way they hung on his every word. Godly gentlemen, he implored, do not be fooled by women's talk of intuition. Do not be fooled by their seductive charms and feminine wiles. God-fearing women, he commanded, do not fall under Satan's spell. There is no higher calling than that of man's helpmate. Any voice that tells you otherwise is certainly not from God. Satan will do all he can to deceive you. The only special knowledge he affords is misery. The only thing you'll gain is regret. Amen, the organist ardently called out from her bench, nearly on the verge of tears. Amen, the congregants cried. Amen, the demon muttered, tasting brimstone in the back of his throat. He'd been to several chapels, temples, meeting houses, and churches as of late, searching for a man who'd meet his needs. Bishop Shelton of the 10th Street Mission had been a terrible disappointment. Father McHenry at St. Patrick's was an uninspiring twit. When he'd heard tell of the reverend's impassioned sermons, he'd come to the Church of the Good Shepherd to see the man for himself. This particular preacher had the added allure of having come from a long line of religious scholars, some of whom had been of great help to the demon in the past. Still, that was no guarantee. As the sermon ended and the crowd shuffled past, he sized up the reverend one last time. Tucking his watch in his pocket, he thought, this man shows promise. But can he kill a witch? By Knot of One. Thirty-six miles up the Hudson as the crow flies, a young woman stood atop the widow's walk of a grand house in Stony Point. To the east lay the silhouettes of ship's masts and church towers beneath the first stars of night. The girl was looking for signs of change, in the skies, in the weather, in her heart. Starry, crisp, clear she penciled in a small notebook. Licking the tip of her finger, she raised it above her head to check the direction of the wind. Nothing unusual, she thought. Nothing unusual ever happens here. Northwest wind, she wrote beside her other observations. No sign of rain. Bright and bored at 17, Beatrice Dunn longed for her life to take an extraordinary turn. She had no reason to think such a thing would ever happen. Still, she hoped, she prayed, she wished. She knew from reading yellowed copies of Scientific American and the Old Farmer's Almanac that the slightest shift in chemistry, in temperature, in the atmosphere, in the stars, could bring about tremendous transformation. 
An avalanche begins with a sound or a misplaced step. Gunpowder explodes with the tiniest of sparks. One flaw in a steam boiler can lead to catastrophe. Lightning can be conjured inside a jar. From time to time, Beatrice made her own lightning by scuffing her feet on the rug in her room and touching her finger to one of her iron bedposts. A sharp charge of static would run through her hand as her nightgown clung to her skin and the tiny hairs along the back of her neck rose to attention. Occasionally, the taste of metal fizzled in her mouth. It was a childish act, she supposed, but it thrilled her nonetheless. If only she could find a spark to set the tinder of her days ablaze. She'd read in the New York Herald that great changes were set to sweep the world in the coming days. Strange, malefic times, whatever cynical people may say to the contrary, are soon to begin due to the presence of an immense planetary influence not seen on Earth for 2,000 years. The vitality of every living thing will be subjected to extraordinary pressures. Surely miracles and mayhem will arise in its wake. To prepare for whatever might come her way, Beatrice had begun keeping track of things that couldn't be explained. Charting every instance of the miraculous that appeared in the news, she faithfully logged them in her notebook as she did the weather, noting the hour of their occurrence as well as the phase of the moon. She aimed to measure the rate of the inexplicable, the temperature of strange. According to her records thus far, instances of unnatural phenomena had risen substantially in the last month, most notably within the city of New York. August 1st, woman has premonitions of death. August 3rd, doppelganger seen on Delancey Street. August 10th, girl thrives without food or drink. August 17th, ghosts haunt the Fifth Avenue Hotel. August 20th, accusations of witchcraft abound. To Beatrice, such accounts were deliciously compelling, not only for the fantastic stories they held, but for the many questions they raised. What is the weight of a soul? Where does it go when we die? Are there such things as ghosts? Can they speak to the living? What of spirits, demons, fairies, and angels? Can dreams hold portents, visions, foretellings? Are witches real? Does magic exist? Night after night, kitchen shears in hand, she sat at her desk cutting squares and columns of newsprint to pin to the walls of her room. Clippings from Venner's Almanac, Scientific American, Ladies' Companion, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, New York Saturday Journal, Fireside Library, and Madame Morrow's Strange Tales of Gotham soon crept across the rose-patterned wallpaper, replacing blossoms and stems with headlines, illustrations, and odd bits of news. Even the advertisements intrigued her. Find God! Find your match, find your fortune in the West. Become an expert in calligraphy, telegraphy, engraving, pottery, telepathy, mesmerism, clairvoyance, embroidery, pianoforte, violin. Discover the ancient art of getting what you wish. The back pages of every newspaper were peppered with the calling cards of mediums, clairvoyants, seers, and mind readers, boasting the ability to converse with spirits, predict the future, find lost treasures, conjure true love. Madame Morrow the Astonisher, Miss Fortuna the Lucky, Mrs. Seymour, Madame Prewster, Miss Adelaide Tom. Was it possible for one city to contain so many mystics? Beatrice was counting the days until she could discover the truth for herself. Twelve days, thirteen sleeps. Respectable lady seeks dependable shop girl. Must be well-versed in sums, etiquette, tea-making, and the language of flowers. Room and board provided. Candidates will be considered on one day only. September 17, 1880, 1 to 5 o'clock. Tea and Sympathy, 933 Broadway, New York, New York. Those averse to magic need not apply. Beatrice had spied the notice while combing through the latest issue of Harper's Weekly. As soon as she'd seen it, she'd felt it was meant for her. 
Even though she guessed there'd be other girls who'd feel much the same, she couldn't imagine that any of them were half as qualified as she was. Had they read Flowers and Flower Lore by Reverend H. Friend cover to cover? Did they have an aunt who was as staunch about the proper preparation of tea as her Aunt Lydia? She doubted it, especially when it came to the latter. Her proficiency with sums was excellent, her appetite for wonder insatiable. She'd need to brush up on her etiquette, but she could do that quite easily with a quick reread of How to Behave. If she didn't get the job, she'd simply march down Third Avenue to the Cooper Union and enroll in its women's course on telegraphy. She'd already committed Mr. Morse's code to memory by practicing the longs and shorts of it on the end of a ruler she'd rigged with elastic to the edge of her desk. If her quest to become a telegrapher failed, then she'd return to her aunt's house in Stony Point, the place she'd called home for the last seven years, and resign herself to a safe, secure, and predictable life. Was she nervous? Da dit, da da dit, dit dit dit. Yes. Was she frightened? Da dit, da da da. No. She traveled to New York first as a child, holding fast to her mother's hand, and then, after her parents' passing, once a year each spring with Aunt Lydia by her side. This time, however, there'd be no frantic rush to find the perfect hat, no fretting over fumes from the train aggravating her aunt's lungs, no worry about getting there and back in a day. This time she was going alone, and she was going to stay. Although she cared deeply for her aunt and would miss her dearly, she relished the thought of being someplace Lydia wasn't. Their relationship had been brought about by a vigorous strain of smallpox that had swept through Albany in the summer of 1873. Beatrice, just shy of her 10th birthday, was the only person in her house to survive. Not long after her parents had died, the court had appointed her mother's sister, Lydia Floss, to serve as Beatrice's guardian, until such time as Miss Dunn is legally wed or turns 19. With quiet composure, Lydia had collected Beatrice's belongings and then whisked the girl away to the Floss family homestead in Stony Point. Nothing here but blue skies, green pastures, and hard-working folk, Lydia had told the girl. I can't remember the last time someone fell ill or came to any harm. They'd lived there, just the two of them, in a house so large that even their shadows occasionally got lost. Beatrice was given proper clothes to wear, healthful food to eat, a roof over her head. Aunt Lydia, the beneficiary of her family's estate and a spinster by choice, had always shown Beatrice a great deal of interest and respect, and, when occasion called for it, on birthdays, at Christmas time, on the anniversary of her parents' deaths, an appropriate amount of affection. Lydia had raised Beatrice in the way she wished she had been raised, by teaching the girl to pick up books because of a love of learning, rather than a desire for praise, to do good deeds because of an enduring belief in kindness, rather than a fear of God's wrath. While the other girls in Stony Point were braiding each other's hair and spreading schoolyard gossip, Beatrice had preferred to sit by the fire, or in summer under a willow tree in the back garden, reading and making figures between her fingers with a loop of string, cat's whiskers, cup and saucer, owl's eyes, witch's broom. When girls her age began pairing off with young men at dances and church socials, Lydia had encouraged Beatrice to look beyond the altar by handing her tracts from teachers' colleges and nursing schools with words of inspiration scrawled in the margins. Fortune favors the prepared mind. Beauty seeks attention. Intelligence commands it. As an ardent follower of Miss Susan B. Anthony, Lydia believed the only path to a woman's betterment was through making her own way. If that path led Beatrice away from Stony Point, then so be it. With this in mind, Beatrice had told Lydia of her plans over her aunt's favorite breakfast, poached eggs, rosehip tea, and toast with blackberry jam. Much to the girl's surprise, Lydia hadn't balked in the slightest. She hadn't lectured her about the dangers of the city, or warned her about seducers and swindlers lurking around every corner. If Beatrice hadn't known better, she might have thought Lydia was happy to see her go. 
In the end, her aunt had given her blessing in the best way she knew how. According to Miss Anthony, she'd said, the girl who is able to earn her own living and pay her own way should be as happy as anybody on earth. There's no match for the sweetness independence brings. Nothing would make me happier than to see you succeed. Staring at the sky, Beatrice thought, Thirteen sleeps before my departure. How lucky am I? Luck, of course, according to her aunt, is what happens when preparation and opportunity collide. What then of magic, Beatrice wondered, of destiny, of kismet? She'd recently read an account of a strange charm found by a farmhand in the rafters of a run-down cottage outside of Terrytown, where a witch was supposed to have lived. It had been fashioned from the simplest of things, a length of string, a few ratty feathers, and six stray hairs, probably from the witch's own head. Nine knots had been tied along it to secure the feathers and hair. When a farmer's wife from the next house over had been asked by a newspaper reporter if she'd ever seen the likes of such a thing before, she'd eagerly replied, Indeed I have. Tis a witch's ladder for healing the sick, protecting loved ones, cursing your enemies, or getting what you wish. It contains some of the strongest magic there is. Once the spell's complete, its magic will be stored in the charm forever so long as the ladder remains whole. There's a rhyme that goes along with it to help the spell set. Would you like to hear it? Beatrice had tucked the spell in her notebook, unsure as to whether she'd ever dare try it. She'd wished on shooting stars, tossed pennies into deep, dark wells. But this was different. A spell required thought, planning, courage, faith. Once it was cast, there'd be no turning back. Taking three black feathers, a length of string, and six strands of red hair from her own head, she began tying knots to secure her wish, reciting the farm woman's verse as she went. By knot of one, my spell's begun. By naught of two, it will come true. By naught of three, so may it be. By naught of four, this power I store. By naught of five, my spell is alive. By naught of six, the spell I fix. By naught of seven, the future all leaven. By naught of eight, my will be fate. By naught of nine, What's done is mine. She hoped the farmer's wife was right. She wished for magic to prove itself true. She wanted to believe in miracles, in fate, and in witches, too. Twelve days, thirteen sleeps. Those averse to magic need not apply. September 17th, 1880 Full moon. The time between first and second sleep is neither slumber nor waking. Too much dark and your mind will stay at rest. Too much light and your dreams will surely flee. Use this time wisely for writing spells, summoning spirits, and most important, remembering your dreams. Queens have been crowned, schemes hatched, fortunes gained, demons defeated, lovers found, all from visions born in the stillness of the night. In dreams, our souls are given the eyes of fate. Dreams must be encouraged by all possible means. The Grimoire of Eleanor St. Clair Between Sleeps Eleanor St. Clair was fast asleep, a pair of silver scissors tucked under her pillow, a sprig of lavender tied to her bedpost. The scissors were for protection against curses and other dark magic, the lavender to foster sweet dreams. As the clock in the shop below her moved through its hourly dance, gears clicking, pendulum ticking, hammer poised to strike, Eleanor stirred but didn't wake. The clock, as if taking pity on the tired woman, slowed to a stop just shy of two. Adelaide Tom, Eleanor's business partner and friend, had forgotten to wind it again. Moonlight shone in the windows of the building where Eleanor slept. Nestled between Markowitz's bakery and the ticket office for the Erie Railroad, the unassuming storefront was easy to miss. 
The awning was faded, its crank frozen with rust. The door was in need of a fresh coat of paint. The sign above it, a simple placard with modest letters painted in cerulean, read, St. Clair and Tom, Tea and Sympathy, Established 1879. To most passers-by, the place was neither remarkable nor inviting. To a select society of ladies who spoke the right words and asked the right questions, it was a place of whispered confessions and secret cures, a refuge run by women they could trust. The crippled awning and peeling paint were of no consequence to Eleanor, who saw no need to attract undue attention from zealots, skeptics, or the law. Assisting women through their difficulties carried certain risks. A young female doctor from the New York Infirmary for Women and Children had been thrown in the tombs for fashioning pessaries from bits of sea sponge and silk floss. Distribution of contraceptive devices. A bookseller who'd sold copies of The Fruits of Philosophy or The Private Companion of Young Married People from behind his counter had met a similar fate distribution of obscene literature. The abortionist, Madame Restel, considered by some to be a savior, by others a sinful hag, had slit her own throat to avoid two years of hard labor. Apothecaries no longer carried French safes or preventative powders for fear that Anthony Comstock and his Society for the Suppression of Vice would shutter their shops. Women who found themselves in trouble were left to their own devices, or worse yet, to quackery. Mail order medicines under the guise of vegetable compounds, regulating elixirs, and an assortment of pills, renovating periodical, Catholic, and lunar, promised to restore female regularity, remove weakness of the stomach, dissolve unwanted uterine growths. While clever language allowed their makers to avoid the long arm of Mr. Comstock, there was no assurance a product would make good on its boasts. Some remedies were woefully ineffective, and still others, by deception, incompetence, or misuse, had cost women their lives. Desperate times make for desperate women, Adelaide had quipped, and desperate women with rich husbands mean more money for us. But Eleanor hadn't gone into business with Adelaide for the money. In her eyes, their venture was more about duty than due. While Adelaide was a creature of the city, Eleanor had been born in a humble cottage on the banks of the Bronx River, far past Williams Bridge and Gun Hill Road, so deep in the woods the place had no name. Her mother, Madame Delphine St. Clair, was a keeper of spells, a gardien du sort, and Eleanor had spent her childhood learning to embrace the traditions of her ancestors, growing herbs, keeping bees, mixing potions. She'd come from a long line of wise women that stretched back to the shores of Normandy and to the woman after whom she'd been named, a woman who, in her mother's words, had been twice a queen as well as a witch. Eleanor's mother had also taught her to carefully guard her gifts. Always need it? Ever hunted, was her motto, spoken each day before rising, written in the margins of her grimoire, carved into the wood of her daughter's cradle beneath the family crest. She'd explained the duties of a witch as thus. A shepherdess sees to the care and feeding of her flock. A seamstress sees to the cut of a lady's dress. Witches see to things best sorted by magic. Sorrows of the heart. Troubles of the mind, regrets of the flesh. This is what we do. That is who you are. As a young woman, Eleanor had briefly abandoned those ways, choosing to leave home and study at the Women's Medical College in Manhattan. But when her mother had taken ill not quite a year into her studies, Eleanor had returned to the cottage to care for her in her dying days. In the years since Madame St. Clair's passing, Eleanor hadn't once considered going back to school. What she'd learned of modern medicine had made it clear to her that the lessons her mother had taught her were the ones she held most dear. Honey infused with saffron, cinnamon, and horny goat weed makes an effective aphrodisiac. A tonic of valerian, mugwort, and poppy heads promises deep sleep and sweet dreams. A pastille containing licorice, skullcap, and chasteberry tames an aggressive lover's lust. 
A mix of rose petals, lavender, lemon balm, and hawthorn berries soothes a broken heart. Red clover, oat straw, nettle, and red raspberry ready a woman's womb for childbearing. Tea brewed from tansy keeps a woman's blood on course. Tansy failing, there are other herbs that can bring things around. Black cohosh, milkweed, pennyroyal, oarweed, Queen Anne's lace. Or, as her mother liked to sing, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Whenever Eleanor was concocting a batch of this or that, Adelaide preferred to sing a different sort of tune. Buds, berries, leaves, and roots keep a girl healthy, wealthy, and loose. Eleanor could only wish her work were as simple as that. For every woman who sidled up to the shop counter wishing to have her heart mended, her beauty increased, her lover made true, or her courses stayed or started, there was a host of enchantments, incantations, and charms for Eleanor to keep in mind. Of all the creatures under heaven, Madame St. Clair used to say, women are by far the most perplexing. It stands to reason that the path to solving their troubles is just as convoluted. Travel it with care, my dear. No matter a lady's concerns or burdens, be they heavy as a millstone or light as a feather, every word she speaks must be heard, every tear she sheds considered. Over the years, Eleanor had kept track of the lessons she'd learned, recording them in a large leather-bound book, a grimoire grown so thick the binding was split. The first time she'd brought the thing out in Adelaide's presence, her friend had cringed at the sight of it. It won't bite, Eleanor had teased, caressing the book's cover. Cross my heart, hope to die. Adelaide had dismissed her words with a haughty shrug. I've seen it, it's seen me, that should be enough. Adelaide was young yet, 21 to Eleanor's 31, but she'd already suffered more than her share of sorrow. Still, the impish soothsayer's quick wit, sense of style, head for business, and keen intuition made her the ideal partner, the perfect complement to Eleanor's unkempt braids, stained apothecary's apron, and brilliantly cluttered mind. Eleanor's only quibble with the girl was that she hadn't yet accepted the truth as to who she was, a seer filled with untold promise, a wise woman in the making. If only she would stop hiding behind the ratty deck of fortune-telling cards she kept in her pocket and embrace the gifts that so clearly had been passed on to her in her blood. In all her life, Eleanor had never met anyone who could peer so thoroughly into the minds and hearts of others as Adelaide could, yet remain so oblivious to the truth in her own. Don't be so hasty to dismiss true magic, Eleanor had advised after Adelaide had recoiled from her grimoire. Your gifts are stronger than you think. Stop plying me with your hocus pocus, Adelaide had said. I'm not like you, and my mother was most certainly not like yours. I'm just a girl from the wrong side of Christie Street, born to a slum house mystic who lived on petty schemes and poppy juice. The only thing my mother ever gave me was reason to doubt her. You shouldn't speak ill of the dead. She never spoke well of me, unless you count the night she sold me away. Don't talk like that. Fine, Adelaide had said. I wouldn't want to give you the morbs. Honestly, Adelaide, you should take these things seriously. Oh, but I do, Adelaide had said, giving the grimoire a sideways look. I could teach you how to use it, Eleanor had offered. I'm sure you'd be a quick study. Adelaide had flatly refused. Women come to me when they wish to hear what they already know. They come to you when they want a miracle. I'll stick with turning cards if it's all the same to you. It's easier that way. Someday what's easy might not be enough, Eleanor had warned. With a smile and a shrug, Adelaide had replied, when that day comes, you'll be the first to know. Resting on a bamboo perch near the head of Eleanor's bed, the witch's pet raven ruffled his feathers and peered into the darkness. Squinting at his mistress, the bird wondered when she might wake. He recalled a time in the not-so-distant past when she'd wake in the middle of each night without fail to light a candle, sit by his side, and tell him her dreams. The bird remembered every last detail of her visions, no matter how odd or insignificant it had seemed. 
How long had it been since she'd last risen in the night? Was she ill? Had she been cursed? Or perhaps, the raven wondered, had man's misguided ambition made the city around them shine too bright? How distracting the sparkle of their false lights was at night, their world barely fit for anything, most especially dreaming. He'd been opposed to leaving the countryside, but it hadn't been his choice to make. He'd promised Madame St. Clair that he'd stay by Eleanor's side no matter what. The wise spellkeeper was dead, so the promise was no longer negotiable. He often wondered if Eleanor too missed the mossy banks of the river, the sound of frog song in the evening, the sweet, buzzy chorus of cicadas rising and falling in the dark. He tried to rouse her by tapping at the gold band that rested around his leg, an ancient ring that bore the inscription, All my trust. Tap, 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 he rapped persistently. Tap, tap, tap. Pulling her pillow over her head, Eleanor gave the bird a gentle scolding. Perdu, she grumbled. Let me sleep. Perdu, from the French, meaning stray or lost, generally reserved for things such as dogs, husbands, and hope. If the bird ever had another name, he couldn't remember what it was. Wake up, he chortled, soft and low. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Eleanor did not obey. Poor thing, thought the bird, how tired she must be. The world is too much for her. The raven was not alone in his concern. As Perdu sat and wished for the company of his mistress, two shadowy beings stood at the foot of her bed. They, however, wished for Eleanor to remain asleep. At first blush, the strange creatures might have been mistaken for a pair of overgrown dragonflies, made from equal parts memory, mischief, goodwill, and longing. They belonged to an ancient order of fae who involved themselves exclusively with the fashioning of dreams. Eleanor, who'd never seen one face to face, had been taught to refer to them collectively as the Dearlies, a name her mother had given them in hopes that her daughter might take kindly to the peculiar creatures and their work. Is that truly what they're called? Eleanor had asked when she was nose high to her mother's hip. No, Madame St. Clair had replied. But they must keep their true name a secret from the dreamers they assist. A person may read or write the name, but if she speaks it, she'll never dream again. Flitting to Eleanor's side, one dearly took hold of the edge of the blanket with her nimble fingers. Then, stealing under the covers, she laid her head on Eleanor's chest. What are you doing? The second dearly asked, following close behind. Hush, the first dearly scolded. I'm measuring the space between her heartbeats. Why four? to calculate her willingness to see when the time is right. To give her the dream, the second dearly inquired. To this point in his life, short by dearly standards, yet biblical by mankind's, he'd been allowed to tend to only the dreams of dogs. He'd been terribly good at it, though, earning himself the name Twitch, on account of his ability to inspire a great deal of tail-thumping, whimpering, and muffled yelps in the canines under his care. Yes, of course, to give her the dream, the first dearly replied. We've only got one chance to get it right. This dearly was called Bright because of her vast intelligence, and because whenever demons were about, she glowed with a vibrant blue light. Plucking a whirl of lavender from the stems tied to Eleanor's bed, Twitch went about the business of preparing the air so the woman's dream might take. Chewing on the flower's buds until his breath was laced with their scent, he readied himself to send the aroma through a tiny clay pipe pointed in Eleanor's direction. Move closer, Bright instructed with an impatient wave of her hand. She hasn't got the nose of a chienne de Saint-Hubert. Always aware that a person's surroundings prepare the mind for dreaming, Bright used every trick she held in her practical, sturdy rucksack of a brain to assist her in her work, from casting bits of spider's silk on Eleanor's eyelashes to clipping the wings off a fly that buzzed too near. Just as a master mason takes great pains in constructing a wondrous cathedral, so too did Bright take the utmost care in crafting Eleanor St. Clair's dream. 
She checked the loft of Eleanor's pillow and cooled its surface by fanning it with her wings, determined that this night, above all others, her charge's sleep would be held together with flying buttresses of stone rather than wattle and daub. How will we know if it's worked? Twitch interrupted, now sitting cross-legged atop a bedpost, puffing away on his pipe. We won't, Bright answered, shaking her head. Not until we do. In a second, in a minute, in an hour, in the morning? Not until we do. All will be well, Twitch announced in an effort to bolster his wavering confidence. This will be good, my friend, you'll see. You shouldn't say such things, Bright said with a sigh. And don't count yourself my friend just yet. A wise dearly never speaks of success. Success. Rolling his eyes, Twitch teeter-tottered his head. What's the harm, I say? It's never hurt me yet. There are other forces at work besides ours, Bright warned. Don't forget that. Like Perdu, Bright had been with Eleanor since the day she was born, and she too was worried that something had come between the wise woman and her dreams. What else could explain Eleanor being stuck in her visionless sleep night after night? Bright guessed that the trouble had been caused by the grief that still lingered in Eleanor's heart over a love affair gone wrong, not to mention the overall harried nature of her life. Recently, she'd started talking in her sleep, sighing over holding too many secrets and mumbling complaints against the landlord. Whatever the cause of Eleanor's distress, Bright was determined to carry on as best she could. If only she could speak to Eleanor directly, she'd tell her that she was truly sorry for her troubles. Grief, regret, and heartbreak were among the most difficult problems to banish, as they had a terrible tendency to hover between a dreamer and her dearlies. Madame St. Clair had always blamed such troubles on the devil, claiming, Satan never sleeps. He stays awake so he can order his demons to mix more straw into the wheat. Bright didn't know much about the devil, and believed him to be more invented than real, but she understood quite a lot about demons. They were dreadfully evil, occasionally smart, and always happy to interfere with a witch's dreams. That was why they needed to be vigilant in delivering Eleanor's dream. They needed to succeed. The entire balance of magic was at stake. The moon was full, the time was nigh, the prophecy had foretold it. Will she remember the dream when she wakes? Twitch asked. If we've done it right, Bright replied. Do you think she'll tell the bird? Perhaps. Is that good? Yes. Will it do what needs to be done? Dreams aren't bound by wants or needs. Dreams do as they please. The vision Bright tucked inside Eleanor's mind was simple, elegant, brief. Intending to transport the woman far from her worries, Bright conjured a hill in the dark of night, surrounded by an ancient landscape that Eleanor had never seen, yet knew in her blood. At the top of the hill, a great bonfire burned, built from an enormous scaffold of twisted sticks and branches. Its flames climbed high into the night sky, hissing and crackling and sending up sparks. Overhead, the moon looked on helplessly as moths dove and spun and sizzled to their deaths. Perdu was there too, perched in a craggy yew tree just steps from the fire. Spreading his wings and opening his beak, he let out a surly caw. The glow of the fire shone in his eyes, and smoke curled from his tongue. Before long, a young woman entered the dream, approaching from the shadows. Circling the fire, she sang a tune under her breath, much like a child who wished to banish her fears. May you rise with the sun, ready to make hay. May the rains come at night to wash your cares away. May you sleep with the angels sitting on your bed. May you be an hour in heaven afore the devil knows you're dead. Bending low, she crouched in front of the fire, her pale skin and copper-colored hair illuminated by its flickering light. With curious calm, she reached out her hand and plucked an ember from the center of the flames. Cradling it in her palm, she turned and held it out to Eleanor. You must help her, Bright whispered in Eleanor's ear, mimicking Madame St. Clair's voice. 
Two is good, but three is better. Together, you'll have untold powers. She is the one, the first of many. Before Eleanor could act, the girl was consumed in a tumult of flames. When the fire threatened to devour Eleanor as well, Perdu flew from the tree and covered her eyes with his wings. With that, the vision was gone. Is it done? Twitch asked, hovering over Bright's shoulder. Yes, Bright answered. It's done. Twitch snuck behind Perdu, steadied himself on the raven's tail, and yanked hard on one of the raven's feathers. Ready or not, it's begun. Flapping and spitting, Perdu let out a loud squawk. Eleanor woke with a start. In her confusion, she thought she smelled smoke, but soon realized a gust of wind had whistled down the chimney pipe, kicking up a whirl of cold ash from the room's iron stove. Sitting up, she struck a match, lit a candle, and tried to hold on to what was left of her dream. To her dismay, all that remained was the sensation of feathers brushing against her cheek, a fleeting glimpse of a young girl's face, and the overwhelming sense that no matter how hard she tried, she'd always be too late to save her. Deuce, Herdieu said with a gentle coo. Deuce was his name for her, from the French meaning soft, gentle, and sweet, generally reserved for things such as melodies, candies, animals, cakes, and sometimes little girls. Eleanor beckoned to the bird and said, Come here, old friend. Perdu cooed again and hopped to her side. Tenderly stroking the tiny feathers that graced the top of the raven's head, she asked the bird a question she'd often asked her mother in her youth. How old is Perdu? Older than you, the bird replied with a throaty chuckle. Her mother had sworn a thousand times over that it was Perdu who'd taught her to speak. He's older and wiser than you and me and all our mothers. Eleanor had never imagined her mother's words could be true, even though she'd always wished them to be. Was that you? She asked her pet. In my dream? Perdu gave a solemn nod. Did you see the girl clearly? He nodded again. Don't forget her, Eleanor said. Remember the girl. Cocking his head, Perdue repeated her instruction. Remember the girl. As Eleanor returned Perdue to his perch, the dearlies looked on from behind a coal scuttle, waiting for their chance to leave. You should apologize to Perdue, Bright said, wagging her finger at Twitch. Tell him you meant no foul. Twitch gave her a confused scowl. Why should I, he asked. He's just a harmless bird. He's not harmless. Bright warned, her cheeks turning blue. And he's no bird. <laughs>